Greetings and welcome back. We are in Junior English and we are turning now to Walt Whitman's classic poem from Leaves of Grass, Song of Myself. By the way, if you're writing about these texts, you will underline Leaves of Grass, and I would suggest you do this now just for practice sake, you will underline Leaves of Grass as a title of a book. That's what the book is called. You will italicize or put in quotation marks Song of Myself because that's the title of a poem. But technically speaking, Song of Myself is a title of a group of poems, not just one. Okay? So already, notice, Whitman is playing games with form here, right? So he's going to call the poem Song of Myself, and then notice he's got a little number there. I'm on page 428 of your hymnals. Notice he's got a little number there, and then he's got a little number 6, and then over on 429 he's got a number 9, and then a number 14. You see how that works? Okay? We will treat each one of those as a separate poem because it is a separate poem. In other words, they're numbered sometimes, like we saw in an earlier lecture, passage 46-47, goes together, right? I am the teacher of athletes. He that uh, 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 learns under my style to destroy the teacher, you'll remember, that is the first line of passage 47 that follows from 46. Every once in a while they go together, but sometimes they are completely separate entities. And so your textbook company has provided you with some of the highlights from Song of Myself. Now, what is this poem? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked. It's a two-part answer. Song of Myself is a poem about Whitman. Song of Myself is a poem about America. Okay? There's a reason why Leaves of Grass continues today to be a bestseller, and it does. No kidding. When you go into Barnes and Noble and you ask them, what's the, what's the poet that you sell the most? They'll always tell you, oh, it's, it's still Walt Whitman. It's quite remarkable. We sell a lot of leaves of grass. Why? Well, I think there's a reason for that. Because he speaks directly to the self, but he also speaks directly to the group, the nation. And any time that we want to remind ourselves of what it means to be an American, we can pick up Song of Myself, and he will tell us, in remarkable language, in remarkable poetic language, dare I say it, in very controversial language at times, he will challenge readers to say, let's celebrate. That's going to be a key word, so I'd write it down as we get ready to look at passage one. Now, how exactly does Whitman begin his famous poem, Song of Myself? Well, let's read it together. I'm now at passage one for you. And instead of using the professional reader, because these are short poems, uh, I will just read. So please forgive my lack of professional reading ability. From Song of Myself, Passage 1. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue... Every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old and in perfect health, begin, hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while, sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard. Nature, without check, with original energy. Now, it is significant that Whitman does some really important things in terms of content. But let's not forget it to be, we need to talk a little bit about form. Notice already, this is not like our Longfellow tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumber, na 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 na. No, 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 we do not have that. Notice the lines, not consistent in length, Notice there is no natural kind of required rhythms, forced rhythms, but rather organic rhythms. So in terms of form, Whitman is playing an iconoclastic game, a term we used before. That is to say, he is not going to write poetry like other people have written poetry. He is not interested in emulating a guy like Longfellow in Psalm of Life. He is interested in doing something fundamentally different, what we will call free verse. It's interesting that the word free gets used always associated with Whitman's poetic attempts because Whitman was the greatest poet of freedom. 
He was the greatest poet of don't tell me what to do. And if you need a single line that qualifies what America is, arguably it is that line, don't tell us what to do. We'll make up our own mind. Well, Whitman will play the same game in regards to the form of his poetry, but wait a minute, let's look at content now and start taking a few notes at level 1 and 2a. Notice he begins, opening lines, opening words of this famous poem, blew people out of the water. He says, I celebrate myself, and I sing myself. I'm going to write a poem all about me, just me, totally about me, yay, me. Whoa, now some would call this a bit of narcissism, some would call this a little bit of egoism. What is up with this egomaniac? He wants to write this long poem of over 50 different numbered poems, and the very first lines are, dude, I want to write a poem totally about me. Yay, me! I am so unbelievable. I'm going to celebrate myself. Optimism or pessimism? A poem like this. Pure optimism. You got it. Whitman is going to be the poet of optimism. And he says, I celebrate myself and I sing myself. Now, if that's all he had said, you might say about him, jeez. I mean, dude, you're kind of a little bit too full of yourself. But look at the next line. What I assume, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me, as good belongs to you. Whoa. Now, wait a minute. Try and put that in your own words at level one. First off, in line one, he says, I'm going I'm to I'm write a poem where I celebrate myself because I am amazing. Can I, can I tell you how amazing I am? That's, that's line one. But then look what he says in the second and the third line. He speaks directly to you, the reader. And he says what? So you're learning how to read here, guys. You can take a couple of lines and then put it in your own words. Look what he says. What I assume about myself, how amazing I am, you shall assume about yourself. For every atom belonging to me, as good belongs to you. In other words, he says, I'm going to write a poem about myself and how amazing I am. In the process of you reading my poetry, you will also celebrate not me, but you. Because we are the same. This is Whitman already introducing the great concept of democracy. We're all equal. Remember, that's what Jefferson had said. Many have said that this is the opening lines of a new declaration of independence. Okay? Think of your dates. 1855. I hope you have that written down. Of course, Tommy and his pals had said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and endowed by that creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. What year did he write that? It's, of course, the significant year in American history, isn't it? 1776. So if you write those two numbers down and do some quick mathematics, 1776 to 1855, you can recognize, well, in 1876, you're 100 years later, so at 1855, right? So you can do the quick mathematics. America has been a nation not quite 100 years, and Whitman is ready to say, let's have a new declaration of independence. This one is going to celebrate what Jefferson couldn't celebrate yet. Because there wasn't a United States of America yet in 1776. It was only beginning. Now it's almost 100 years later, and Whitman is going to say, we're Americans. We are amazing people. What's remarkable, of course, is that Leaves of Grass later will get read by people all over the world who aren't American. And they will look at it and say, you know, a lot of what he says about Americans, he could really be saying about us as human beings. We are an amazing species when we come to understand what we're capable of. To that degree, the optimism can grow even beyond America. Look at the next thing he says. He tells us a little bit about who he was. I think in my introductory comments I told you about this. I loaf and invite my soul. What does it mean to be a loaf? What does it mean? Well, Whitman was a guy that loved to be lazy. He loved to go out and just lay in the park. 
He said daydreaming is the essence of creativity. And when you were a kid, you did it all the time. And then all of a sudden, as you got older, you got so busy that you don't know how to just go to the park and just lay down. I've often assigned this to my students as an assignment. Go to the park and lay, and you can't leave that spot for 30 whole minutes. You have to lay there for 30 minutes. Turn your phone off so you can't be interrupted. And I dare you to try to do this. Some of you will go absolutely crazy. It will drive you nuts. You, you, you never sit still long enough. Whitman will say, just lay in the grass. Notice he does mention here in the next, in the next uh, line, I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. For Whitman, grass is significant because grass is the great symbol that is, I'm going to use a vocab word here that's new to some of you, ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. It means it's everywhere. It's everywhere. A few years ago, they strapped some harness on me and a rope, and they pointed up a rock face, telling me I was supposed to climb. No, dude, it's this sport called rock climbing. It'll be great. Just don't look down. And so up I went, and I was climbing, and I was pretty high up on the rock face, and all of a sudden I looked down. And that was a bad idea, because then I realized that I'd been going up for a while, and that if the rope didn't work, there would be no more Mr. McGee. When all of a sudden, I looked into the rock face, and this area where my hand was holding, and I was grateful for the handhold, and guess what? There was grass growing there. No, grass. There were several blades of grass, to which I reported to my colleagues down below. They were not surprised. Whitman was right. They went, what? And I said, Whitman, Whitman was right. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, there's grass up here. And I pointed with the wrong hand, and then I almost fell. There's grass up here. It's growing. It's even here. This is Whitman's point. Grass is everywhere. You cannot escape it, just like you cannot escape the great voice of Whitman as American. You can't escape. Notice the next one. My tongue. This is going to be the poet of the body. You want to write this down. Whitman will celebrate... Everything about the human body, let's just say it. If you have it on your body, it's going to end up in some poem in Song of Myself, and it will, which is why, again, some people are going to say, really? You're going to write about those body parts? Whitman's like, why are we ashamed of those body parts? They're just as important as every other part, right? Notice, my lip, my tongue, Every atom of my blood, by the way, just point out, that's the second time he's used the word atom. In 1855, you might note this, Whitman was already the part of a new movement in America that was very much scientific. People were reading new scientists, people were wanting to know about the world, and Whitman will constantly be talking about science. But you'll remember in passage 48, he says, science can never explain a bean in its pod. You can open that bean up, or he likes to use the eyeball as an example. No matter how much we learn, there's still the mystery of nature and the wonder of it all. But notice, my tongue, every atom of my blood, uh-oh, where does Whitman come from? Formed from this soil. Whoa, that's, that's important. This air. Soil and air of where? Notice he says, born here. He doesn't even have to say the word. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't have to use the A word. He doesn't have to say America. He knows that Americans will be the one, Americans will be the one reading this poem. Born here of parents. Born here from parents the same. And their parents the same. Unless you're counting. That's third generation. That is to say, long ago, my family came from Holland. Whitman Dutch, part Dutch. But now, America, born here, from parents born here, from grandparents born here. That is to say, I'm a part of this dirt. I'm a part of this air. Whitman will point out that you're as much a part of the ground in your birth as you are a part of the ground when you die. Of course, when you die, where do you go? Dust thou art, to dust returneth. You go back to the dirt, right? Whitman will point out, really all we are is walking dirt with a little bit of water. But that's an amazing thing because we're special walking dirt. We're born here. Americans, that is to say. I, and then he tells us the first piece of real close biography. 
He tells us he's 37 years old. That's significant, and I'd write it down. Whitman is not some young prodigy writing poetry at the age of 19 or 20, like John Keats, who, by the way, of course, he's going to marvel at, the great British poet John Keats. But Whitman lives a full life, does all of this stuff, Whitman is the answer to the student who once said to me, this poetry crap has absolutely nothing to do with real life. To which Whitman responds, dude, I totally agree with you. So I am not going to write poetry like anything you've ever heard. I'm going to write poetry after I've worked at a Big Mac, after I've worked at a construction site, after I've carried a bunch of people's poop from outside of a, uh, out of a, out of a, a, a cleanup spot or something like that. I've done real labor, Whitman will say. I've lived 37 years of my life, keep reading, and I'm in perfect health. He loves to talk about how if you want to be healthy, you got to be active. Whitman loved to go out into the ocean and go for swims. He's still living in a time when a lot of Americans do not take baths all the time. There are stories of Americans taking one bath a year. And Whitman will say about that, yeah, no, 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 no. You should be clean. You should be energetic. You should be dynamic. We'll get to the last word. What's the last word of the first poem? What's the last word of the first poem? It's going to be the most important word of all of Whitman's poetry. And we'll get to it in a moment, but obviously we can see it. Hoping to cease not till death. That's interesting. Because in 1892, he did die. What's interesting is he never did stop cease. He never did stop. He worked writing these poems until the day he died. So in, at the age of 37, in, in, in uh, 1855, he says, You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to spend the rest of my life, and I'm going to write these poems. Because these poems matter. They are important in some fundamental way. It reminds us of what Thoreau said in his classic text, Walden, we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn that does not go away, does not change. He says, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability for a man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. Of course, Whitman's going to love that line, conscious endeavor. You can build your whole life around a conscious endeavor. Whitman says it took him 37 years. Man, this gives some of my students hope. 37 years before he figured out what he was going to be when he grew up. That's almost 40 years he lives. And people would ask him, what are you going to be when you grow up? And he'd go, I don't know, I haven't figured it out yet. 40. You don't have to know when you're 18. In fact, why would you want to know when you're 18? That's kind of sad and tragic. Why don't you go out and live a life until you're 40 and then decide what you want to be when you grow up. That's what Whitman did. And it makes some sense in some ways to say, I'll try stuff and see how it works out. And that's kind of the approach Whitman took. Of course, because he had all of those amazing experiences, he could write for all those different kinds of people. So, for example, a millionaire could pick up leaves of grass and read it and get it. Whitman hung out with some really wealthy people. But also a person who's homeless can pick up leaves of grass and read it and go, oh, he recognizes that I exist too. Notice the final ones. And this is already going to be Radical Whitman. Read it with me. Creeds and schools in abeyance. Now, that line doesn't mean anything to you unless you know what the word abeyance means. So I'm hoping you're writing down that word, abeyance, and try and use it a couple of times later today just to make sure that you've learned it. Abeyance means what? Well, it means to kind of stop. Okay, to kind of stop. That is to say, for a brief period of time, to kind of stop. What is a creed? Well, we're talking about a religious text. We know what schools are. Put it in your own words at level one. What exactly is it that he's saying about this, uh, uh, about this collection of lines he's going to start writing? He's going to say, I'm going to kind of challenge religion, creeds, and I'm going to challenge school education. He says, just for a little while, I'm going to allow them to retire back. Look at the next line. A little while. Suffice that what they are, but never forgotten. This is significant. Whitman says, dude, what they taught me in church and religion and what they taught me in school might be important, but I'm going to kind of take that information, I'm going to set it aside just for a little bit, 
I harbor for good or bad. And then the next one. I permit to speak at every hazard. Woo. He is going to allow himself to say whatever he wants to say. What's freedom if I can't use it is his point. So I am going to use it. And so I'm going to say some things that are going to offend, he says. It's kind of like a warning almost. I'm going to say some things that religious people and school people are maybe not going to be so happy about. We've already looked at passage 46, 47, destroy the teacher. Do you think there were one or two teachers that were a little offended by the term that the greatest job of a student is to destroy the teacher? There's one or two teachers that probably read that. Well, oh, what are you saying, right? See how that works? Finally, he says, nature, capital N. Back to our conversation with Emerson in our two boxes. He's not only going to work with that first box, he's going to be working with that second box. Nature without check, with original, and then there's our word. We want to write it down. For Whitman, this is the key. Everything is about energy. The energy of a person, the energy of Ruthie's tree, the energy of a nation, right? And remember our conversation with Thoreau about energy loss and the ways in which some of you sitting there right now would have to report, hmm, why? Why? Hmm. Well, the truth of the matter is energy levels may be low. Notice the adjective, original energy. Whitman knew from the very beginning in 1855 he would do something original, something that had not yet been done. Are you ready for this? Something American. Purely American. New. Original. I've often argued that if you want to be a patriot, then you've got to have something to be proud of. You can be proud of a poet like Whitman because he gives you the license to celebrate yourself and your country. And in passage one, he opens the doors to get all of that done. Of course, at level 2B, we can make any number of observations about the poetics, and I think I mentioned several the examples of free verse are there. Of course, you can jot down a movie at level 3A that for you is your favorite movie about America, your favorite movie that talks about how great America is as a country of originality. You can also jot down maybe your favorite movie about originality. What is for you your greatest movie about a creator, somebody who creates and is very original in his or her mind, the things that he or she does? And then finally, 3B. This poem sometimes kind of makes some of my students a little bit unsettled. When you look at a picture of yourself, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it the words, whoa, I am stunning, or is it, Ooh, I wish I hadn't done, I, ooh. Why is it that the first time we look at ourselves in a mirror, our tendencies are to see our flaws? What's wrong with us? As opposed to what's right with us. Whitman will remind you, you should think about yourself as amazing. Amazing. And you should see yourself that way. Why is it that for some of us, yeah, but you don't understand, dude. There's all kinds of things wrong with me. Whitman says, Join the human condition. There's things wrong with all of us. But why is it the first thing that you look at has to be the negative? Why can't it be the original energy, the celebration of the positive? Where do you come down on that? Do you celebrate yourself? Or do you kind of maybe curse yourself sometimes? Do you look at other people and wish you could be more like them? Or do you look at other people and say, I wish they could be more like me? Ooh, now that's an interesting question. Some of you will say, I am not conceited like that. Whitman says, there's no conceit here. In the moment that you celebrate yourself, you can also celebrate other people. Why? Because we're all originals. We're all summer spears of grass. And no piece of grass is ever the same. Just like they taught you in elementary school. It's true that no snowflake is the same. But it doesn't matter until you believe it. I hope you hear Whitman say this. It doesn't matter until you're convinced of it. Notice he celebrates his perfect health. The truth of the matter is, Whitman struggled with health 
later in his life, some of that having to do, as I think I told you, about working in those army hospitals where lots and lots of germs and stuff were there, right? Of course, the final observation disturbs us as well. Why is it that sometimes if a person celebrates himself or herself, we have a tendency to kind of go, oh, please. Why is that? Why is it that we can often not stand a person who wants to talk about himself or herself as being unique? Why is that? Why is it that we have a tendency to want to put people down instead of lift people up? Why is that? I once had a student that said, oh, that's a nasty question, Mr. McGee, because I realize in a heartbeat and in a moment, I'm the oldest brother, and I'm always putting my little sister down. And the reason is because she's so stinking smart, and she wants me to know it. And instead of celebrating that, I've tried to put her down to make her feel lesser. Why is that? Whitman says, it's simple. You don't understand who you are. If you understood who you were, you would celebrate that. If you celebrate yourself, then and only then can you celebrate others. And if you can celebrate others, then you can celebrate your nation. Because we are a nation, Whitman says in 1855, of celebrated people. By the way, these lines, very controversial, but they catch on. And people begin to say, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. It's often the case that creeds, religion, and school, education, are the two places that make me feel down. They make me feel like I'm lesser. They make me feel, as one of my students once said, why she hated school so much, it's the place where I feel dumb. And Whitman goes, dumb? How tragic is that? Nobody can make you feel dumb until you decide to make you feel dumb. Are there things you don't know? Yeah, but there's things everybody doesn't know. That is to say, celebrate who you are and what you are. Original energy. Maybe if you don't feel like you have much energy, it's because you don't understand that you are energy. Twice the word atom gets used. Well, what's an atom? Oh, that's the thing that we make molecules of. Well, what's an atom made up of? Oh, man, we don't know that. Okay, we'll call it a quark. What's a quark made up of? Dude, nobody knows. There ain't one person on this planet that can tell you that. So let's just use his last word, energy, and say that's what you are. You are walking energy. Why not celebrate that? It's quite a remarkable thing that you're sitting here, and you're breathing, and your blood is pumping, and your brain is working. Why not celebrate that? Yeah, but my brain doesn't work as well as his or hers. Whitman says, no, you've missed the point entirely. Right? We all have abilities. Let's celebrate those. There you go, an introduction to, now it'll make sense, song of myself, Whitman loving music. We'll talk maybe more about that later.